And welcome to Muddy River News This Week. I'm Bob Goff. We're talking about the Washington Theater today with Kathy Dooley and Brian Heinz. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. You guys have a big fundraiser coming up. We absolutely, absolutely do. Right. Yes. So on Saturday, May 4th, uh, starting at 6 p.m. at the Washington Theater, which is 427 yes. Hampshire. Very good. Okay. Yes. Yeah, it's one of those things that everybody knows where it is. Sure. Like I see the, the marquee. Yeah. Right. So go to the marquee. And from uh, 6 to 1030, we're going to have a fabulous uh, gala. And we are... Um, see, I said that right. So anyway, it's, it's but, a, no, no, because like I'm from the East Coast, so we say gal. Ah, uh, and but I've been corrected so many there times now. So and I'm saying that's probably the first time I said it right. But <laughs> but anyway, but um, one of the main reasons is to get people into the theater sure. to see the treasure that it is. Uh, but my main goal is to uh, thank um, uh, this incredible couple, uh, Signe and the late Tony Oakley. Sure who have been on the theater commission since Chuck Schultz started it in right. 2004. And they are the only, Signe is the only person left uh, who has not given up uh, through um, some great, great struggles and has tried her best given they've donated generously of their own money and everything like that. But uh, the community needs to thank her and the late Tony to just, and not just for the theater, but exactly. I mean, she championed uh, special education right. in, the, in the Quincy area before it was cool or anybody yeah. knew about it. I, I was telling somebody this morning, um, you know, the, the group that she was the president of, for, she and Tony for many years, was actually called the Adams County a Retarded Citizens Association. Mm -hmm. Now, can you imagine using those yeah. terms no. today? But I mean, 50 years ago, when she had the uh, golf thing at the club, oh, know, yeah. she, she, they, they have always, always been championing, championing um, children and adults sure. with uh, disabilities. So like, this is just a moment where we can get people into the theater, have some fun, and uh, really thank her for what, sh what she and her husband have done. Well, they've, they've been very big in so many others. They've been longtime supporters of the arts broadly. Yes. Uh, German Fest, uh, she's always a big sponsor and supporter of that. And with the Sister City program, she, she represents Quincy every time they go to Germany. She hosts them when they come here. So there's so many things that uh, the Oakleys have been supportive of, and, and we want to honor that. And that's something that this town for so many generations uh, the philanthropy of the citizens here is just immense and Quincy needs to recognize some of the the pioneers of that no uh, no question about it and the Washington Theater of course uh, you know we've got the lighted marquee and the exterior looks good but you still got a little work to do on the inside right Brian yes uh, and, and a lot of people are saying well we've heard the song and dance for years and when are we going to see something we spent close to a million dollars on it already, but it's stuff that you don't see that sure. still has to be done, all right? So we had to have a whole new roof put on it. Yep. Uh, we've done secondary roof on another part. We just did that, and that was $80,000 this, this fall in November. We've done tuck pointing. We've done stabilization of the foundation. All the stuff that you have to do that's not cheap to prevent further damage. So mm -hmm. when you go in, yes, there's water damage and all that for the years that it was vacant and nobody was paying attention to it. So if you don't have a strong foundation you start doing all the nice things that people see it could be damaged again and you have to backtrack so we did a we had a fifteen thousand dollar grant we did facade work to clean that all up and remove some metal that had been attached and it was rusted and, and stained in the terracotta tile so there's been a lot of work done on this already but you know this is just the beginning and and when we do this um, this fundraiser or any others whether it's trivia night or movie night that uh, pepsi sponsors this year the money that we raised for that we know it's not going to be a huge uh, um, pot that we're going to bring in to renovate it, but what we're trying to do is, yes, raise money, but also to bring attention to the theater that we're here, that we're going. Uh, we spent over $75,000 during COVID, which was a hard time for us. Uh, we hired a theater architect based out of Texas that he and his company, all they do is the historic renovation restoration of historic theaters mm -hmm. so we now have blueprints we have game plans we've got a monetary value for each thing now we can start applying for grants and now we're, we're viable we're a license we're 40501c so sure. we're here but a lot of people uh, in this day and age the, uh, the saying uh, that i like is the quickest way to stupidity is through the internet because people <laughs> will believe anything so yeah. there's misinformation <laughs> that's out there sure. and everything and miss one that I, I had to respond to quite lengthy in an email was, 
oh, that's a waste of city taxpayer money. There's no city tax money has gone into this cedar. This has all been done thus far with private donations and grants that we've gotten. So and we're proud of that. Kathy, uh, why why is restoring this theater important to the community? Well, uh, first of all, um, we're a, I believe we're um, known for our architecture, and uh, this man, Brian, correct me, is it H. W. Rupert? Uh, his last name is Rupert. Okay. okay, and I guess he was one of the greatest architects of Illinois history and the entire Midwest. And he came here, and I just learned this because Jim Lawrence is like the source of all this yeah, amazing very much knowledge. So. Right. And um, in 1921, I guess there was a huge celebration in Washington Square, which we're also trying to celebrate that week. I, I'm really, really trying to get people to celebrate Quincy and just to bring some joy back here. Sure. There's a lot of, <laughs> you know, Quincy is more than potholes. <laughs> you know, it just yes. like that's all I hear about. And like it's such a, an amazing place, but like we, the people, who should be celebrating and right. bringing joy so and I think they need to get off their phones and like get physically with each other so that's another reason to come you know to do that but he, Mr. Rupert came in 1921 from Chicago he had relatives here and he came to a huge picnic that was in Washington Square at that time and then he saw this uh, the buildings that were there and he said wow this would be like a fabulous location for a theater to be built. And so by 1924, 1924 that all yes. came to fruition. Wow. And he, he built in Illinois uh, 10 theaters. And he was responsible for helping also. I guess there were six theaters on Hampshire. Wow. And there's uh, the oh, Bijou, there the thing. Yeah, so, I mean, all these different, in the article that I sent you, I mean, they're mm -hmm. all, I list some of them in there because, like, I had no idea. So uh, the one where one is right now, mm -hmm. that's another theater that he consulted with. But the only one, like, he did was the Washington Theater. But in the state of Illinois, there's only two of his theaters that exist oh, wow. anymore. And one is in Chicago, and one is here in Quincy, Illinois. So, you know, for a town that spouts off about all of our architecture and all of those things um you know i think it's really a, a major treasure but just go down to washington park and like if we knock that down 3.2 million dollars to not to knock it down yeah okay it's next to a um a libations establishment or mm -hmm. otherwise known as a bar sure <laughs> all right and a public restroom right across the street yeah and so you have this huge hole in downtown Quincy, yeah. which is, uh, you know, a great place for a homeless community to like thrive and to do all that stuff. But like, once you take that anchor, yeah. it's an anchor of that square and people in Quincy have to pay attention to their downtown, okay? Yeah. And maybe I, I think that more because I'm from Philadelphia and like if Philadelphians forgot to pay attention to their downtown, there would be no more Philadelphia, right. you know? But I mean, you have to pay attention to those things by supporting the Sixth Street thing. And you, you have to, um, because I, I like that my teacher in me says, <laughs> okay, the, those children who are in high school right now, especially are really, really smart. And they're listening to all this negativity. And why would they want to come back here, or why would they want to live here? It's like, oh my goodness, gosh, that all everybody I love and respect is like all they do is talk about potholes, and all they do is this, and all they do. And I know potholes are important. I know that. I know that, right? <laughs> and but anyway, but like the the negative vibe like really really upsets me because the children are listening. <laughs> Michelle, uh, when last time she every time she comes home, she spends some time and she just drives around town because yeah. she misses it and she just wants to go and look and see different stuff and she just does loops and she didn't complain about the potholes once she just right. did the drive and no, came back and, right. she, and she's it's, she finds it you know very soothing well so. and the thing is uh, the theater the architecture of it and if you've never been in it it's it's awe-inspiring to walk in it so i cool. can remember being a kid and going to the you know and everybody comes back to disney movies but that's what i remember and it's 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 immense and a lot of people don't realize just how large this is so one of the things we're up against is uh quincy doesn't need another theater and we don't need another uh, auditorium, auditorium, if you will. So uh, the response is, this will be unlike anything Quincy has to offer. In fact, sure. it would be comparable to what you would find at uh, if you're in St. Louis and you go to um, the Pageant Theater. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this isn't going to be redone and opened up again as a movie theater. It would fail. So what it's going to be, it's going to be a multi-purpose venue. So 
Uh, for those who have never been in it, it is a raked seating, so it's got a slant to it. Mm -hmm. What we're going to do is we're going to level it out and have four different levels of platforms in there. So this could be used, yes, as a theater. We could have banquet table setups, chairs, uh, cocktail tables, any kind of configuration. We can have live concerts in there again. We could have stand-up comedy, touring acts. It could be a wedding. It could be a wedding reception. It could be a business uh, function for a corporation to bring in people for a day for a, a business meeting. It could be used as a dinner theater, a, a one-scene play. You're limited by imagination. It could, we want to work in conjunction with the Children's Museum. If they have something, an idea that they want to use and they have for children, but they don't have the space for it, we'd be available. So there's so much that this can be used for. So uh, there was a feasibility study done um, about 20 years ago uh, for the downtown, and they said one of the key components of the downtown would be an open, usable theater that the Washington Theater could be. If that was open, and this is 2004, I think numbers would bring $4 million of revenue to the city of Quincy. Now that equates to about $6 million. Yeah. So for those worried about potholes, a lot could be fixed with those. But it, the amazing thing is then people say, oh, you're going to sell that many tickets. You don't understand. Say we bring in a, a live concert, and it might be a major act that's traveling between Chicago and St. Louis. They right. can come in at a large discount, have a show. So do you want to spend $50 on a ticket or 75 versus 150 and drive to St. Louis? Right. But when the people come to these things, they're coming downtown. They're going to be wanting to go out to eat. They want to go out for drinks. If they're coming far enough, they need to stay at a hotel room. So you're talking about payroll for all these businesses and then the suppliers of food and drinks to them that's local so it, this is just comes full circle and it's, it would just be a huge opportunity to bring even more life to downtown that's seen a renaissance really in the last five to ten years um, so let's talk about the event itself on May 4th uh, there's a lot of cool stuff you guys are auctioning off right absolutely so besides this it's sixty five dollars a person or a table of eight is four hundred and fifty dollars you can go to our web page you can go on facebook and you can uh, use paypal and get and reserve that table we're limiting it to 20 or 21 tables so you know you may want to get those reservations in i think it's moved to 25 25 all right we got it set got up yes, Good. Right. So, Good. Anyway, well. um, so it's going to be a, a dinner carving station we're going to have bars uh, cash bars available uh, but we're going to have a live auction, not a silent one where it's, uh, no offense, there's no oil changes that you're bidding <laughs> on or a car detail. So it's cool stuff. We want to do it. So we got uh, Hanson Spear, who, when we've talked about supporting the community and everything, along with the Oakleys, uh, our hats off. Uh, yep. Brian Durante and Will Spear have carried on through They've tradition that Jeff and amazing. Terry have just done and, yeah. and George and Charlotte. So, again, those that, that know it, they've, they've given their Cardinal Cub tickets, the coveted ones, to Wrigley Field. And along with it, round trip tickets on Amtrak for four people. Uh, Pepsi's donated uh, their uh, seats for a Cardinal Cud game uh, in July. We've got um, uh, the chef Kevin Minnick. He's the chef's table, a private dinner with each course getting one of his special bourbons. Uh, we've got, I've told you, you can say what kind of bourbon it is because I'm not a bourbon drinker. Happy Van Winkle. All right. A there bottle you go. of that's going to be. <laughs> that, that's no, $1,500 a bottle. Real, real, well, they're all excited. I'm going like, what's the big deal? It's, no, it's, <laughs> so, I, I, it's really I good. I've had it once. Oh, it's once. So really, <laughs> once. Yes. So, uh, once. So just right. once. Yeah. But yeah, um, it's so really we got good. that. We got a private airplane ride for two people um, that uh, a great friend and supporter, Randy Phillips, is doing in his 1946, I believe, Stinson that's mm -hmm. been totally redone. Um, we've got a seance at the Lorenzo Bowl House. So we've got other th items also, but we want to bring people in and have a lot of fun and raise money and, and, and salute Tony and Signe. And well, just have some joy and whatever yeah. in there. So and then and it's Dogwood Weekend, and, and right? Entertainment. I'm thinking yes. like, we used to have this big celebration and we used to yeah. do all those things and like it was really joyful. I can I do I have time to like tell sure. big big misnomer there because I probably am more versed in this than any person in this community, but we don't have uh, performance venues in auditoriums. Those are teaching facilities. My orchestras, <laughs> like they practice there yeah. every, that is their classroom. At Quincy Senior High School, that is their classroom. Sure. They have stagecraft, they have things. So people, th like in their minds, they think they have these yeah. auditoriums or theaters, but I'll just use many people, we do share the Quincy Junior High Auditorium with the community, but every time, let's just say the symphony comes in for a Wednesday night event. That means on Tuesday, uh, the, the, all three orchestras have to lose instruction because they have to take 
everything in their classroom and pack it up and move it to the fifth floor of junior high. So then Wednesday, the symphony comes in. Then Thursday, they have to go back up to the fifth. And these are little, you know, little puny kids carrying like six <laughs> foot bases. They have to carry it back down to the stage. So they basically lose a day and a half to a two days of instruction. Now, can you imagine the science teachers yeah. like saying like, okay, like you got to pack up your labs and people are moving in here tomorrow and then on Tuesday, you know, get that. So, and then I'm sure John Wood, which is a wonderful facility, but it only seats 300, right. you know, but especially the ones in the schools are educational facilities that we, when we can, we love to share with the community, but they're just not sitting there empty waiting for Right. We don't, we acts. don't have <laughs> a thousand seat venue in this community exactly. that no. is, that has a lot of flexibility. And community theater, yes. they're right. doing all their performances right. back to back. And that seats, what, 500? 550, I think. Yeah. And, I mean, they, they are really, really functioning as wonderful facilities during the daytime. And it's great when we get to, like, share them what, but it's not sitting there empty for right. any reason. No right? question about it. So. I'd be remiss. We do have entertainment for the evening. So oh, my the gentleman gracious. will be performing oh, good. Uh, after the dinner. And Kathy lined up. Uh, the River City Swing uh, Group nice. will be there. Okay, so they're going to be playing during the uh, cocktail hour. So That anyway, sounds like a lot of fun. Right, absolutely. So, right. so again, May 4th, right? May 4th, yes. All right. Um, and the hours once more one more time. Uh, 6 o'clock starts the cocktail hour, and we were there just 6 till 1030. Right? All right. Fabulous dinner. Yes. Well, thank you guys a lot for stopping <laughs> oh, by. Like I said, we appreciate it and appreciate all the effort. And yeah, and it is. I mean, I've been in it a few times as it's progressing. And, yeah, we it's certainly something that's worth saving. So if you've got the time, please do that. Thanks again Appreciate for stopping it. by. Thank you so much. All right, Thank coming you. up, we're going to talk to the folks of the Adams County Health Department about opioid abuse. What kind of shows will you see on Muddy River Gems each month? The same award-winning storytelling from Mark McDonald and crew that you enjoyed for nearly 20 years on PBS. Muddy River Gems with host Mark McDonald. A new episode every month online from Muddy River News. My guests today are from Adams County. We have, of course, the uh, director of the health department, Jared Welch, and uh, Robert Rich, the member of the county board who uh, his uh, health uh, committee uh, oversees the health department. Welcome, gentlemen. Uh, we're talking about opioids today. I assume you didn't bring any. No, we don't have any with us today, I don't think. <laughs> Bob, right? No, I'm talking through. Okay. <laughs> well, you are a doctor. I mean, come on. Yeah, you, I have a narcotics license, so I should have one. So, yeah. But anyway, what we're seriously talking about is the money uh, that the uh, county is now receiving from the uh, National Opioid Settlement Fund. And, uh, of course, this was uh, discussed at the county board level, uh, you know, as this was uh, coming down the pike. Jared, talk a little bit about it. Well, I tell you what, it's a, it's a really good opportunity for Adams County. We, um, we are a participant in the national settlement, so the way this all developed, Illinois became a participant in the class action suit nationwide. Adams County participated in that. The, the county board uh, gets those dollars then, and what I think is important here in Adams County is uh, what they've done is not say, we're going to spend these dollars, we're going to you know, throw them around, whatever, throw money at something. Um, they asked the health department to compile a group of experts to, uh, which is not us necessarily, we're just the compiler, mm -hmm. uh, to come in and evaluate projects that the community will bring forth to, to get innovative solutions into the community. We already have a lot of programs here. Um, these dollars are meant to supplement them. They're meant to bring innovations. Um, they're meant to cover things that can't be covered in other, in other you know, grants, et cetera. So. Dr. Rich, talk a little bit about that because, as you know, anytime uh, a, 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 pile, a new a new funding source comes into government, government always wants to figure out what to do with it. Talk about your discussions with your colleagues about uh, how you should handle this. We want this to be significant. It's not it's not the world's greatest amount of money, and we aren't going to solve the opioid problem with it. But we want to make an impact in our county with it, and we're really looking for for applications that are really in it innovative we, we're looking for something different I mean we just don't want to build another halfway house or we just don't want to do this this or this we want to we want people to be very creative and we've got a very good committee to, to do this but as we all know uh, opioids are a bigger 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 problem than all of us realize and I think that 
and I mentioned this the other day in an interview, uh, uh, drug addicted people can look just like you and I. I mean, if you have, if you're in an auto accident and all of a sudden you can't get off your uh, narcotics or in this area, the other thing we're really concerned with is the meth. We mess not an opioid, but we are including that in our problems. But I, you don't have to look very far to find somebody that's lost a relative to, uh, to uh, drugs. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think just because it says opioids, uh, the, you, you should be able to use it to, to fight any other addiction, shouldn't you? Yeah, absolutely. And fortunately, uh, the way the settlement's negotiated out, Illinois is able to spend those dollars on substance use. Now, opioids certainly one of the focuses, and rightly so. Uh, you know, we lose thousands of people per year in Illinois uh, from opioid overdoses, but um, yeah, here, meth is, continues to be a major driver of, of our drug problem as well. And the the funding, uh, if I remember correctly, it comes in, how much is it? And it comes in like monthly, right? You get a monthly stipend, I guess, if you will? It's periodic. I just periodic. checked with the treasurer's office. We just got another $12,000 check. Uh, we hadn't gotten one for a couple months. Uh, ultimately, uh, we were supposed to get around 1.2 to 1.3 million dollars over several years. Right. Uh, in the short view, there's 750,000 coming over the next two or three years, is my understanding from the treasurer's office. But uh, it's not a, a big bulk of money, but it's coming over a period of time, and that's because as 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 different pharmaceutical companies and drug companies settle this, they're trying to find their way to to, to pay it. Right. And uh, and 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 Jared, this all came about. Kind of talk about how this all came about and, and why the drug companies are, are now uh, are doing this. Okay. Yeah, historically, so opioids have been around for a long, long time. And they've been around as a treatment for a long, long time. But the marketing process early on in, in prescription opioids brought forth to the doctors, uh, this, is a, this is the miracle drug. Your patients will have no pain. And, and the key here is it's not addictive. Oh my gosh. Well, we found out otherwise on that one, but but you know, it's you can almost liken it to what happened with tobacco. You know, tobacco's great for you. Mm -hmm. And and so it's the yeah. same thing. So that's how it emerged and then, you know, over the years all the addictions came and it went from a prescription drug problem to as over the last decade, uh we've seen prescriptions on opioids decrease drastically. Uh you know, we went from from these are safe, they're good, hand them out. Uh, to, uh oh, there's a problem, to, uh oh, people are seeking these drugs, they're going to the doctor and making stuff up, uh, and, and we've gotten kind of over that hump. And now, though, what's been replaced with that is heroin on the street, fentanyl coming into the community. So you're going to, uh, as I say, scratch that itch somehow, and now it's moved from prescription to illegal prescription is still a problem as well but not to the degree it was and uh, yeah it's you're, you're trading one addiction for another right. basically right. so um and i guess you know i guess there was some was there some thinking that when they decide to legalize marijuana this would be a way to maybe combat that a little bit or no i haven't personally heard that um you know i marijuana's got its own set of warts sure as well but um you know i guess that all things equal uh this is a much bigger bigger negative yeah. and and winds people up not only addicted but you know in the justice system and things like that much more and uh you know uh dr richards uh you know again fighting this problem also helps the county at another level that can maybe help keep some people out of the jail yes we uh, it, it's terrible you see somebody ends up in jail and they're trying to recover from opioid addiction and uh, there's nothing there to help them how if you had this, how would you? I had a hard time quitting smoking. Nicotine was my baby. Mm -hmm. you know, God help you, you're trying to go over heroin, and you're going cold turkey, and you're sitting in our jail. Yeah. So there's, we have to have empathy for those people. I think the jail population, there should be less. The crime has followed the opioids in yes. the county. A lot of our shootings, et cetera. And the sheriff can speak, and the sheriff's on our committee. Sure. Can, can speak to this. Um, I just don't think people really realize. If you stand back at 50,000 feet and look, and everybody has to have some Narcan, and, and I could have, if I had somebody worried about at home, I could have Narcan. Or I'm worried who's going to be my dog sitter because we got opioids left for my last dental appointment. And I shouldn't say that. My dentist has been giving me opioids. Sure. Don't get me wrong. But sure. I mean, that's the way it used to be. Yeah. People, people go through your drug cabinet. Or uh, in my particular situation, I have a, a granddaughter that's uh, in college, and uh, she has to be careful where she goes, uh, opioids. I mean, it's a danger everywhere. Right. And I, it'd just be nice if we come up with some really innovative ways to, to perhaps 
muffle it, help, or, or be, increase public awareness. But the sad thing is uh, not all counties are jumping on this. And now some of the counties, a small population, don't get much money. But sure. I did talk to somebody. They said, well, we don't have an opioid problem. And I'm like. Well, well you're, you're fooling yourself. <laughs> It's I wish, everywhere. I wish we didn't. Yeah, we they're, they're really fooling themselves. But but like you said, when this stuff first came out, like you said, you, you smoked for years. And back then in the, you know, in the, and then, you know, when you were growing up in the 50s and 60s and stuff, you had ball players and cigarette ads. Well, and four out of five doctors yeah. were camels. <laughs> right, right. And, and, yeah. And now they're getting off on the menthol. You know, yeah. I mean, it's just uh, everybody smoked cools. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it was uh, your, your mother smoked, and uh, if, you weren't an ath- if you weren't in athletics, you smoked. Yeah. But. God help us if we have an addictive personality, which I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a hard thing to shake. And, uh, again, like you said, with the opioids, you know, the Vicodins and the Percocets and all that stuff, the people. I mean, I remember when my wife had back surgery years ago and, you know, took Vicodin. And she's like, this is pretty good stuff. Yes. And uh, But, you know, she realized that, oh, okay, that's, you know, you can't only so much of that. And then it, it became that, well, yeah, you really shouldn't take that. You should take this. And then the next thing, well, you probably shouldn't take this either. You should take this. So, you know, we always have to be cognizant of this kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. You know, one part of the problem is that still, even though the prescriptions are, are handled much better than they were, they wind up sitting in a, in a cabinet at a house. And, you know, we do uh, youth surveys in the schools. And in Adams County, um, 5% of our eighth graders have taken a prescription that is not theirs. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's Vicodin. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, in that survey, at eighth grade level, uh, sure. kids are getting in the medicine cabinet. No doubt about it. And also, this also affects, uh, like you said, I said it affects the jail, but it affects other forms of county government, like the ambulance. I mean, you have the ambulance people going on OD runs all the time, too. Mm-hmm. Lots of them. So, and uh, I think that's one thing that to look at. When, when you talk about a drug problem, people look at it and they say, well, it's their fault. They're the addict. They're the ones that need to just get off it. Well, it's not that easy. And, again, it's not just an isolated problem because, again, it leads to perhaps violence it perhaps leads to somebody doing something committing a crime it leads to the ambulance having to pick somebody up it, it it's a cycle and and if you break that cycle you can you it you know it's not going to solve every ill but it can sure it can sure it can sure cut down on some of the headaches oh, absolutely. absolutely guys anything else to add well i tell you what uh one more plug on narcan and the idea that you know these folks are are good pe- anybody you just said your wife liked it Mm-hmm. I, I had a prescription of 15 years ago, and I took it, and I was like, oh, this is good I stuff. get it. This is I good stuff. Um, and, and so it is. it can become a sickness, and that's really how we need to approach this. This is not a – it certainly can be a criminal activity, and it is as well. But it is a sickness for people, and, and that's the part we need to move past the stigma of, oh, this is a druggie. No, it's, it's a good person who something – something happened to they had an injury whatever here it comes so so narcan uh it used to be harder to get now you can get narcan over the counter you can keep it in your home i'm not saying that everybody has to but i'm saying if you know somebody uh who might be struggling with addiction man narcan is the antidote to an overdose of opioids and you can have it in your house you can have it in your car you can have it in your emergency kit and if someone you love or someone you know has a problem you might just save their life all right well i appreciate the time doc thanks again for all the work you thank and your you. committee are doing too thank you there the uh, application is on the health department uh, website uh it'll be reviewed by the committee uh we're looking for something really innovative and we're many things i mean the door is wide open and sure. I, I hope that people can find something that jared and the health department and the medical professionals have, have not thought of that we can do with the money to make it really count i hate hey when government money comes and you see those black birds just circling <laughs> yeah, we don't want that yeah so. no it definitely uh, th- this money needs to be put back in to fight the problem because that's that's what the money was awarded for in the first place so well gentlemen thank you for your time Thanks, thank bob. you thank you very much that's all the time we have for now i'm bob goff have a great week <laughs>